welcome to the first round of the second round of the, um, of the term and a year from this academic year. Coming along with all the train strikes. So we try and run these events about uh, two or three times every term. Um, and we have a wide variety of speakers um, on different topics. And the next one is on next week, on infectious diseases. Uh, it's on tweeting about infectious diseases yeah. with Megan Carl from uh, the UK Health Security Agency. So, yeah. <laughs> Do come along. Yeah. So, so my name is Salmi Amwuthi. I am a senior policy analyst at the PhD Foundation. The PhD Foundation is a health policy think tank. We're based across the road. We look at um, the use of novel technologies, specifically genomic technologies within health services. And it's my pleasure today to invite Maxine McIntosh from Genomics England to come and talk to us about tackling bias and inequities in health and genomic data. So Maxine. Very background I saw from your bio. Started off, I'd say, in statistics, machine learning, and moved into genomics, but all, all to do with better use of data, I'd say. Yes, hopefully. Thank you for doing your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, because we are a small group of people in person, <laughs> um, uh, and now even more perfect form now at Spotted Rose, um, who currently is reading a lot of consent materials uh, with Jill. Um, so we're, I mean, very grateful for her for spending time out of doing that to come to this. Um, please do interrupt and ask questions um, because, yeah, that's the point of coming to things in person as well. Um, so uh, who here feels somewhat prof proficient in genomics? Now, if I say what's a variant, be if you know what a variant is. Yeah, you know what the issue is from your brain is. Go off. <laughs> 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 okay, so like, you know what? I really don't know if that whole bunch of Okay, that's good. Right. So that's okay. So my background is in genomics. So um please don't ask me lots of really mean questions about genomics. This is actually going to be more about sort of data is a data bias with a few kind of news to gauge uh, roughly the angle at which people are coming at the um, so, uh, ooh, which device? Okay. So, um, broadly, my interests over the last sort of decade or so have been on like data science, machine learning, statistics, um, as applied to health and genomics, and then where that intersects with questions of diversity, equity, and inclusion and fairness. And I freaking love a community. Like, if I, I, I seem to not be able to do anything by myself. I always have to work through others and communities. So I love being part of communities. I love setting up communities. So um, I've set up two that are kind of practitioner communities. One's called One Health Tech and one's called Data Science for Health Equity. And, and both are around improving diversity and inclusion in health data and um, uh, fairness, equity, all those sorts of things. Um, I've even got a running group actually called The Reluctant Runners, and you can only do it if you hate running. Um, so that's how much I love community. I like, want you to do it to go for a run without people being around. Um, so because uh, we are here in person, I wanted to like start with a bit of a game. So just so that everyone doesn't think I'm this sort of technocratic side of these things we just solve social inequalities like I obviously don't think that um but I am obviously a big advocate of the better use of data um to address um particularly health inequalities so um we're going to start with a bit of a game and if you came and saw the kind of size being previewed please don't be an old and shout out <laughs> so um we get three guesses, and whoever gets the closest gets a really exciting prize. And if you're allergic to nuts, I'm really sorry, it's not that exciting a prize. Um, so, uh, do you know what percentage of participants in GWAS studies are of European ancestry? Very high. Okay, fantastic. Qualitative answer. We're looking for numbers here. 90%. 90, okay. No, lower. 85. 70. 70, higher. 85. Okay, Ooh, you're the winner. Oh. Right, cool. We'll, we'll do best of three so we can sort of talk. Right, so 78%, but I'm going to put like a tilde because this data is a few years old, depends how you want to look at the data, but like roughly, roughly 80%. Okay, next one. The ratio of global health research compared to burden of disease. So we're looking at how much research we spend, how much money we spend on research globally, and what percentage of um, burden of disease that applies. So we're looking at like, we're looking at numbers like 20, 80, or 50, 50, or 60, 40. So how much money do we have on global health research? And how so total amount does, that, does that apply to where the burden really lies? It's a lot of money. 
I'm not going in the right place. Okay, yes, so that's correct. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's tax numbers for that statement. Uh, what, a, a, a dollar number? We're looking for a ratio. <gasps> Five to one. Uh, okay, no. Um, 2018. 2018, okay, not quite. Third guess? That was the same, 2018. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's 1090. So I'm going to give you the one because you're, you're, you were the closest. Cool, okay. Last one is um, the percentage of senior professor level scientists in the UK who are black. 8%. 8%. No, lower. 1%. 1%. Okay, so lower. Lower. Oh, that was, that was three. Rose, you get that one because you said one. Cool, right. So 0.6%. Oh, sorry. Can someone send me a link to Maria Goodall? If she'd like to join online, she can't. Maria Goodall is making a good appearance, virtually, like that. <laughs> Whoever Maria is, feel very good. Thank you, guys. Cool. Okay. So, um, the reason why I wanted to kind of give you free chocolate, um, I don't want to kind of put it in picture, about inequalities in data. Yes, the data matters, but also you can think about the environment in which that data is collected. So this, if you've ever seen certainly my talk or anyone who's given a talk about uh, genomics and inequalities, this is kind of the canonical slide. So the number of individuals in your studies of European ancestry um, sits approximately 80%, but this is as a proportion, it's massively increasing. And that's just because um, the number of individuals in your studies over time is increasing, but the red bit, which is Europeans, um, is taking up a bigger proportion. So in some respects, the situation is getting worse. Um, we saw like a mild improvement when there was a bit of a, a rise in East Asian initiatives, particularly in China. Um, but as you can see, um, again, the kind of particularly North Western European initiatives are dominated by British and white North American genomic initiatives has really taken over. Um, you can kind of look at this from different angles as well. So um, uh, when you look at the number of studies, um, you can still see that it's very dominated by individuals of European ancestry. Um, certainly East Asian initiatives come well above their weight when we're looking at that compared to the participants, um, but still it's nowhere near reflective of the actual global um, populations by, by ancestry. Um, so there's loads of different ways. Well, you could, you could, talk. You could say it's one of the matter. Sorry. Um, yes. Can I ask, um, is that because East Asian studies um, reuse um, data better, or is that because European studies are bigger or something else? I actually don't know the exact answer to that question, um, but for this paper, it was very much that um, well, I guess it would be the reuse, it would be that um, there are more, uh, there's more research output per data set in these station initiatives. So I guess, yeah, like, yeah, reuse, I suppose. Thank you. Um, so you could say kind of like, actually, does diversity really matter? Like, why do we actually care about having more diversity data sets? Um, and we can kind of see lots of different examples as to why this matters. This is just one of them. So um, this uh, is uh, looking at the transferability of polygenic schools. You don't, really know what, you don't need to know what project score is. It's, it's like a risk score. And um, by and large, this does vary by trait in relative and absolute population size. But by and large, when you train a polygenic score on a population of European ancestry and you apply that to different ancestries, you tend to find it less transferable as you move across these ancestries. And so by and large, on average, when you develop a PRS on a European ancestry and apply it to an, an individual of African ancestry, it's roughly four and a half times less accurate. Um, but kind of less doom and gloom, like why does this matter from a kind of benefits perspective? Um, I guess this is, if you know lots about genetics, this is kind of obvious, but the main thing that we're interested in is about discoverability. So um, ability to discover new associations is dependent on both effect size and the frequency of the variants. And then certainly there's a huge benefit in understudy populations that if some variants are common in, in some groups, but where in others, there's this kind of huge untapped resource in the associations we didn't even know existed. Uh, and certainly, if you are of African ancestry, you punch well above your weight in terms of your contribution to genetic discoveries. Um, so a little factoid that whilst only 2% of GWAS studies are made up of individuals of European uh, African ancestry, they contribute about 7% of positive and significant associations. Um, so it's just to say that if we were to even be more biased and say which populations should we be centering our efforts on, um, and we were to really reflect it, then we would scientifically certainly be selecting individuals of African ancestry because of how rich um, in terms of genetic diversity those populations are.
Um, so it's also important to nest this in the context of the fact that our healthcare is increasingly becoming digitized. That really matters when we're looking at, say, the richness of the phenotypes that are sitting around us. And of course, it's been a, a few years of quite sort of turbulent social change, particularly on axes of ethnicity and deprivation. Um, and this is quite a complicated landscape when we're thinking about diversity and genetics. You've got kind of questions of looking at human migration. You've got lots of different national initiatives across the world that are looking to sequence their own populations. And you've got, well, certainly uh, in the UK and certainly even on Gower Street, um, you've got a kind of fairly recent, very live uh, eugenic history. Um, I don't actually have any for a Roche for this one, but does anyone know who the chat bottom left is? Whoa, folks, you should know you're cancelled eugenicists. Um, it's Francis Galton. Um, so uh, when you mix all of these things together, um, it makes for quite a kind of um, morally, ethically, scientifically complex area to work in. And um, to be honest, uh, Galton looks like sort of every other slightly Victorian writer. <laughs> so um, one of the things that's very important to recognize, and this is kind of applying a data ethics lens to this question, uh, is that I'm going to quote Ruha Benjamin, who is this amazing scholar. She's written lots and lots of um, great literature, particularly a book called Race After Technology. But Ruha said, data and technologies are socially constructed and embed design decisions, assumptions, values, and ideologies that can be discriminatory and generate social problems. And kind of the point of this is that when we create data sets, we bake our values into them. So zooming out a bit, what does that kind of really mean? And this is, I think, a very nice graphic that a friend of mine, David Leslie, put together for a paper um, a couple of years ago, which basically tries to map all the ways in which bias can creep into the data sets that we use in health. And um, these are, are applied all across the pipeline. Some of them are kind of big macro harms, some of them are really, really small and, and, and micro. But the point is that there's this kind of cornucopia of the ways in which bias can enter into data-driven systems. Um, that's all kind of quite wordy and there's a lot going on. So I've also thought I'd just quote Adam Rutherford because he had a really nice pithy answer to it, which is that we must always expect science to be misrepresented, overstated and misunderstood because it's complex, because the data is unending and because people are strange. And I think that's probably just something quite important to remember is that when we're trying to uh, understand the way the data biases manifest, we've got to recognize that, that people are quite strange and odd decisions do get made um, and we are all biased in one way or another. So um, you kind of know that things have hit mainstream when you go to your parents, you say like, oh, you know, mom, dad, I work in data bias, and they kind of know what you're talking about. Um, so that's uh, that's actually quite nice that it feels like this issue of kind of biased AI or biased healthcare or biased data sets or biased genomics does seem to be elevating a little bit more in the public consciousness. So here are just, you know, some random screenshots, one of an academic article, one of, of a more kind of um, widespread media article, and then thirdly, a screenshot of um, the announcement of a review launched by at the time our health secretary Sajid Javid into um, bias of medical devices. Um, and this is just to say that it's kind of nice to see that now more public attention is being given to this issue from lots and lots of different lenses. Um, and in fact, it matters so much that we made a program for it at Gel. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna summarize what Genomics England does uh, in basically one minute. And that's because I think that many people might have known what Genomics England was by setting up the 100,000 Genomes Project. And then there's been this period of big change. So I'm gonna kind of slightly summarize it in a way that's probably not um, like how our comms team has summarized it, but I think it hopefully makes sense. So. Genomics England was set up uh, about 10 years ago. We were a private company owned by the Department of Health, which is kind of government's way of being a bit sort of trendy and agile. Mm -hmm. And we then uh, ran the people the 100,000 Genomes Project, which involved sequencing individuals with cancer and rare disease. It was 78,000 participants actually, but 100,000 genomes because uh, most of the cancer participants had um, two sequences of item. Um, and the, well, the analysis, even though the sequencing for that has been complete, the analysis is very much ongoing. Lots of the participants still don't have results back. So that's very much running um, uh, in the foreground um, for us at Genomics England. But whilst that then project uh, kind of finished, we then went through this period of sort of soul searching and head scratching. I say we, I've only joined about two years ago. Um, and Genomics England has now evolved to do two things. One is provide the back end to something called Genomic Medicine Service. So we basically provide the platform for a lot of our national genetic testing within the NHS. And then for participants who consent to their data being used for research, that then goes into our research environment. There's lots of other things that happen on the side of that. Um, and the diversity program is sitting here on the kind of uh, research side of things in the sense that um, we are looking to enrich the data diversity of our research asset. 
So um, the Diversity State Initiative was set up two years ago, and the whole aim of it was to reduce inequalities in genetic medicine. Uh, and we went through this quite um, extensive period of working out and consulting exactly what we should focus our priorities and what we should focus our, our attention on. Um, and we landed on these kind of five priority areas. So one is sickle cell, another is maternal health, another is equity in genomic medicine, a fourth one is Link23, which is a kind of open source tooling initiative, and then lastly, a more uh, methodological um, program called Emerging Technologies and Methods. I won't go too much into the details of what each of them is. In terms of um, the sort of main, I guess, levers or work streams, depending on how sort of government you want to be about um, how you think about change, we kind of mostly work in these four uh, areas. So one is research and discovery. Our idea is that we will both stimulate and carry out quite a lot of research in the space to both understand data biases, but also stimulate the research community to ask more questions of communities that to date have been underrepresented. Uh, secondly, community and engagement. This for us is both top down and bottom up. So bottom up, we have we work with grassroots communities, patient groups, community groups, to understand their concerns and their needs around genomics, but also top down, how do you work with other institutions um, in the country so that we're all at least pulling in the same direction from the data diversity agenda. Um, and so a really good example of, of how we're working with bioresource to, to align on that for sickle cell. Um, thirdly, data and sequencing. This is definitely our most sort of extensive work stream, um, but this is us, but we're going to be producing at least 15,000 whole genome sequences for individuals of non-European ancestry but also looking to enrich a lot of the other data that sits around that genetic data, because um, genetic data is only as useful as what it could be associated with. So if you've got really poor phenotypes, um, and a lot often poor phenotypes follow these social, social stratifications, and we want to think about data enrichment in a broader sense of the term. And then our fourth work stream we've called product source of behaviors. And the point of this is that it's all well and good having lots more data, but if no one changes the way they work or no one changes their attitudes or no one changes their approaches, then we're not gonna see any impact of having collected all this data. Um, so a really sort of slightly basic but quite common example is that you're not gonna get people to put their hands up because I think everyone would probably put their hand up. But if you've done any sort of uh, uh, analysis of the genomic data, um, most people at some point will have just got rid of a lot of the minority populations in their analyses because it makes your results slightly less clean. It makes it sort of it makes a good journal that's like slightly less good, and so it's very easy just to bin those individuals of non-European ancestry because often the population size is too small. You know that's not a data problem; that's a kind of researcher incentive behavior problem. Um, so we want to make it as easy as possible for individuals to improve the equity impacts of their work. So that's everything from an algorithm that deals with the sample imbalance right to a handbook with how do you speak to Papua New Guineans about genomics. Both of those things for us represent a tool. We want to make it really easy for people to change their behaviors. So um, diverse data is cool. Diverse data, there's clearly a very big focus on the data bit of it. Um, and that is definitely a really, really important component of the program is really addressing the data biases that we have in our data at Genomics England and certainly uh, more broadly in the UK. But we also want to be very cognizant, going back to that you know, diagram of days, that there's the one ways in which bias has been entered into our world. But actually, if we're thinking about this from a research context, there's many points in the research pathway um, where a bias can be there. Um, and this, I think, is a really, was to be quite an important, I guess, scaffolding for our program to think <clears> about <throat> the whole way in which research is produced and research culture and research outputs. And what we can do at every point of this research pipeline to do our bit to make it more equitable. So um, what I'm gonna do now for the kind of, uh, second bit of the talk is A, just orientate um, you about how we think about bias and equities within gel, and then basically just give a few examples of some of the projects we've worked on across that research pipeline. And then we've got plenty of things. Some of you might be able to answer some of mine, not mine. So, um, it's very easy to look at that GWAS graph, you know, the big red one with European ancestry one, and think, well, you just sequence more individuals of non-European ancestry. That feels quite, quite simple. Um, but actually within that, exactly what you should do is, is really, really murky. When you look at the literature, there's a real uh, kind of sludge of definitions about what diversity actually means, how to define underrepresented, what outcomes for what purpose. Um, and so we went through quite an extensive process to really interrogate what we really meant by equity and diversity and inclusion. So um, one of the things that's been quite important for me kind of intellectually to, to make this make sense in my head 
is that there, I do feel that there has been a big narrative, particularly in the sort of AI machine learning community, that biased data is just something you have to fix. And you can kind of potentially kind of throw a technical solution at it. And actually, I think that biased data provides us individuals, institutions, with this amazing opportunity to kind of look into the data and reflect back at us biases that we might not have associated or known that existed in the first place. So um, we recently published a paper, paper, paper in the New England Journal, but kind of one of the analogies is that in archaeology, when you dig up an artifact, often when you look at that, you are building a picture of what an ancient civilization did and their values and their cultures and their history and their practices. And it kind of almost acts as a, a window into their community, and into their culture. And that can be incredibly informative for things we might not have noticed. And so that's one of the more, I guess, positive lenses that I wanted to apply to this problem to say, actually, how, how about we use the opportunity to investigate these biases as a way to kind of hold up a cracked mirror to our own understanding of the world. So we do this in a few ways, um, and this might look like a slightly trivial and silly example, but actually it's been quite informative to, to sort of help break down the problem into something that's um, uh, easy to digest. So this was conducted by a few of you, who's been from the team, she's a design researcher. Um, so what we're looking at here is a representation of decisions at Joe, and it's kind of purposefully sufficiently granular and blurry that you can't actually see what we've written, um, but I'm going to talk you through all the different bits of it. So on the left we have um, a representation called the bias building. And this looks to us to break down all the different decisions at Joe um, that potentially could introduce some bias into what we do. So everything that's here below ground is what happens to the data before it comes into Joe. And then in order to get to the dizzy heights of the helicopter at the top, you have to basically go up these pink steps. And these pink steps for us represent like big decisions that happen in the organization. So it's not necessary to say that you have to avoid it. In order to get to helicopters, you have to make the decision. We're just recognizing the impact that all of these decisions might have. These are the sort of big macro things that happen in terms of the way that we process um, data at Gel. Then for each, I guess, unit in the way that Gel operates, we then um, created very different sort of templates about it. And this is a now a full plan for each of these different levels at Gel. Um, and what you're seeing here is a full plan of rooms. And each room, again, here represents a kind of meso level decision. And in order to get from one end of the room to the other, you have to pass through these doors. And each of these doors, again, represents a meso level of decision. Um, so again, it's not to say that you, uh, you just don't make the decision, it's recognizing the impact of that decision. Then once you go into a kind of an individual room, you then start. Whoop, you then start to um, get like you know flower plants and carpets and sofas and lamps or whatever. And each of these things for us represents a very very specific point intervention or problem at Joel that potentially could be a manifestation of a bias. So for example, um, we found out that if you have a non-Latin character in your name. On average, it takes you about two weeks longer to get access to our environment, research environment, because of effectively a kind of computer says no problem. Now, that's not obviously a massive problem for social inequities, but it's just one example of a tiny kind of death by a thousand paper cuts that just creates a little bit of friction for individuals who are, say, not in the majority when they're thinking about the traffic landscape. And so when you overlay all these tiny little things, you create you know, quite hostile environments for some people in some populations. Um, so this was a kind of um, an MVP of an approach. We didn't manage to do that across the whole organization, but it started to, to allow us to hold the space for the sort of the big systemic and institutional problems, but break the problem down into a sufficiently granular way that you don't kind of feel you have to solve and then institutional racism by lunchtime. Um, and you can actually just pick off these little problems and bit by bit just celebrate the small wins. Um, we then also just took slightly different approaches. Again, this is the benefit of working with um, design researchers. They just have incredible ways of, 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 of analyzing and assessing the world. But another thing that, that Sophia did is that she went through and mapped out our diagnostic pipelines. And again, the process in our diagnostic pipelines and where, where from a kind of more bioinformatics perspective, we might be introducing biases into the work that we do. This was then supported by um, a more bioinformatic analysis whereby um, Matt Silver, who's kind of recently joined the team, and, and Tweed Salmon, who are um, bioinformaticians and data scientists in the diverse data team. And um, that team looked at all sorts of different questions, largely around do we have some sort of ancestry, ethnicity, or insert other demographic factor here, bias in our data, in our diagnostic pipelines, and in the way that we consider ancestry. So we did all sorts of things from looking at the representative, representativeness of our cancer cohort 
to the way in which we tier variants for our conditions to the granularity in which we infer people's ancestry. So, for example, when we joined, we only grouped people into the five content by ancestral groups, and now we read that a much higher resolution. So, putting those things together, it allowed us to kind of create a bit of a map that was slightly more unbiased, slightly more hypothesis free to say, right, where are the actual problems we need to solve within Genomics England? And can we articulate them sufficiently specifically that we can actually start to build a plan around? So moving down that kind of pathway of all the different problems that we could work on within diversity and industry, um, the, the quite varied ways in which we're picking up. So the first one, if we go back to um, you know uh, that that pathway I, I, I showed, is looking at the questions we pose. So uh, one of the things that was quite important for us is that um, it's all well and good creating a really rich asset of data, say from individuals of African ancestry with sickle cell. But if once we make that data available to the research community, researchers only ask the questions that they've always asked, that only matter to them, and those questions say are only relevant to like, a certain group of researchers, we sort of miss a trick here. And so one of the things we wanted to do is whilst we're creating this um, new sickle cell research, um, new sickle cell economic data set, we wanted to pair that with a uh, research plan effectively and a research agenda that's been determined by and designed by patients. So this project, we're working with um, the Sickle Cell Society and a group called the James Lind Alliance, who have this kind of trusted methodology and established methodology by which to consult and um, surface the, the main research priorities and particularly matters to patients, but also to some extent clinicians. And this is made up of a kind of series of different activities, focus groups, surveys, there's lots of different ways to go about doing it. But the ult ultimate outcome is it creates a kind of list of like your top 10 mm -hmm. research priorities. Um, so this is being uh, led by uh, Marie Nugent, who's our engagement manager. Um, and we hope that you know, come 18 months when this process is finished, we'll both have this am amazing sickle cell data set and it will be paired with this patient-led um, research agenda. So that could hopefully mean that the research community, um, I guess, checks themselves about what questions they're really looking to answer. Um, and they are asking and answering the ones that really matter to the patient community. Um, secondly, uh, the data we use. So obviously this is a big part of the programme, we're going to pay a lot of attention to this. Um, we're working across a lot of different priority areas, um, but our, our main ones are sickle cell um, as one of the, um, the, the, the most common, but kind of rare in the UK, I suppose, um, the genetic uh, conditions and that today has been one most neglected. Um, so that's the one we're working uh, with Rose and, and the rest of the virus of Steve on. Another one that we are um, going to be doing lots of data and generation in is uh, maternal health. The maternal health that has very, very poor outcomes, particularly by ethnicity. Um, now, obviously, that isn't exclusively because of genetic causes, but genetics probably does play some role. And so we want to kind of add um, our hat and ring to say, right, how can we help disaggregate our, our biological determinants of these outcomes versus social? And more generally, we are going to be um, uh, doing whole genome sequencing for individuals of non-European ancestries across a range of different ancestries, because no matter where you look, um, particularly the individuals of African ancestry, but the, the, the sample size of all of these populations remains kind of too low um, and to do lots of new analysis. Um, this one, I think, is quite an interesting example. So um, how you set up your question has a huge amount of bias that could be entered into it. And one of the things that I did when I arrived is I asked a bunch of people, if you had 22 million pounds, who would you work with? Please help me. <laughs> um, and, you know, people felt really strong. People said, oh, you, know, you, should be, you could be sequencing people to be representative of the UK ethnic population. Other people said, no, no, you need to kind of future proof yourself. You should be looking at the, you know, ethnic makeup in the kind of next five, 10 years and gun for that. Other people said, well, you know, we should recognize our place in the global landscape. We should try and be representative of the global ancestries. Okay, so that's, those are quite some ones. Fine. And then a whole different cadre of people said things like, um, oh, it should be outcomes based. You should be focusing on populations that if you were to be able to create lots of new data, do lots of community engagement and generate lots of tools that would have the biggest cost savings to the NHS. Okay, like an outcomes based approach is a bit different. Um, other people found felt that um, because gel uh, is pretty good at cancer and rare disease and everything else, maybe less so, um, that we should really be focusing on where we are most undiverse in cancer and rare diseases. And then other groups of people said, actually, we should be looking at um, which groups have been most neglected, and most harmed to date, and we should be paying attention to those and working for those populations. So they're all quite different. Um, and people felt quite strongly about all of them. And so one of the things that we did was that we kind of 
crudely bumped um, uh, bundled these different strategies together and assessed these against kind of agglomerated bioethical principles. Again, not to say that there's a wrong or right answer, but in choosing one approach, we are prioritizing either looking at public benefit or we're looking at particular you know, responsible stewardship, or maybe we are prioritizing fairness and justice. Mm -hmm. It's not to say one is right or not, but just that in making that decision, we are baking our values into that, um, the data sets um, and the way that they're comprised. Well, then you decide. So that was actually where the, the focus areas I um, I found on six on the terms of the sexual freedom law was the to be by those focus areas most addressed the, the biggest variety of people's you know, things. So we actually didn't have only one, we just took a uh, sort of portfolio approach. Probably in hindsight, that didn't mean that doesn't mean that the programs are not more complicated to run. Um business. <laughs> Um, but actually, there's a real diversity of the approaches we took, and actually, as a program that has started from scratch, even though that's made it harder to, to run, I think that we've managed to test these different approaches with different populations. So now I think we would uh, be in a much stronger position to um, proactively design what that job is. Um, but it was a really, really interesting process and just demonstrated how complicated to find an underrepresented is. I guess that's something for all of you to bear in mind that if you are involved in any initiative, um, just to think carefully about what it is you're trying to diversify against, what's the outcome you're actually looking to achieve, and you need to define diversity based on that. There's not a kind of off-the-shelf way that you can actually define diversity. Um, another way that we're considering this in terms of the study outcomes and the design is um, Candice King, who's our PKI manager. Um, she's about to kickstart a series of engagement activities um, that are uh, engaging with women and birthing people around the barriers that they feel um, they experience with access to genomic research, particularly for maternal health. Um, again, as I said before, this is a particularly interesting problem because many people will have very um, personal, very extremely, very negative experiences of, of their maternal journey. And a lot of that will be to do with, say, racialized care in the NHS. Um, and so it's not to say that uh, genomics plays no role, but we have to be really careful with how we, uh, I guess, combine those social and genetic factors in maternal health and aggregate them. But also we're really sensitive to the ways in which we engage with patients to say, you know, you might have, you might have a stillbirth or something horrible, then say to say a woman who does actually experience huge racism in her maternal journey, that genetic factor and would be incredibly unjust. So balancing this one for us is a really interesting one about talking about genomics in this really sensitive area, particularly with minority ethnic populations. Um, this will hopefully give us a range of insights that will help shape uh, a new and emerging collaboration, particularly with the Tommy's charity around preterm birth. So um, that's very much uh, early days in, in, in the works, but hopefully that will give us a really good um, scaffolding to hang some key decisions off that study design thereafter. Um, from like a more methodological perspective, um, I kind of referred to this earlier, but when we arrived um, as the diverse data team at GEL, um, like with many projects and initiatives, um, people are grouped into these five continental ancestral groups. Um, and most people will know that within Europe alone, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity. Um, and so simply saying I'm European or I'm Asian or I'm African doesn't really say a lot. There's more genetic diversity within Africa and between Africa and say other continents. So one of the key impacts of that is that some groups remain unassigned. Some groups are bundled into their ancestries where actually they don't really fit. And that means that that has a whole range of cascading impacts in terms of how common or rare say some variants have felt to that population. So going from five to 10 to 15 to 20 is quite an important component of us um, making sure that everyone is as best represented by their ancestry, but obviously, we're aware we can't all live in a continuum of categorialists. Um, and so we've got to balance the kind of practical realities of the fact that we do need some buckets, but we can definitely be more specific with our buckets. So um, Sam Tolman has been increasingly refining our ancestry uh, inference in the 100K to even more granular detail, um, which has produced a very beautiful jellyfish, um, which is how he describes it. Um, there's nothing actually uh, to explain the spatial representation of this. It's just to make sure that it's and clear, but the, the size of the globules, i.e. these are the participants in 100,000, will show you our distribution. And this is actually very informative for us because we can really see which populations, we specifically, and I'm sure we can definitely do more, are most underrepresented. So for example, you know, we know that East Africans are particularly underrepresented, so that can be used by us as a program to say, okay, if we're gonna go out and do proactive sequencing, how do we make sure that we're engaging in the kind of 10 in the UK? 
given how much one represented the other us. Um, then kind of lastly, one of the things that um, is important for us is that we create kind of communities of practice of under and understanding about how on earth we tackle issues of genomic data equity. And also how do we make sure that this is a, gl this is a global conversation? Um, so whilst the UK definitely kind of punches above its weight in terms of its output for genomics, we also need to kind of have some humility in how we work with international partners, particularly international partners that to date have been largely excluded from these genomic medicine efforts. So Link23 is a bit of an experiment. Um, uh, it's going to be 18 years, uh, 18 months of um, having you over pay. So uh, Link23 is a new open source global initiative which could curate and create open source tools for equity and genomics. So if you thought, I don't know what you just said, um, the idea is that we will pull together as many tools, and tools, again, is very broad, tools that we can um, find that in some way improve equity and genomics. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is that we will then work on challenges that are relevant to challenge partners across the world um, and bring a global community of statisticians, bioinformaticians, social scientists, clinicians, patients together on these challenges to collaborate over these new solutions. And they're all solutions are made widely available and publicly available um, under open source licenses. Um, this means that it allows us to work more internationally. It's a lot more easier to work on methods and approaches than it is over data. Not to say that we wouldn't want to work over data, but it's a kind of a, an easier stepping stone. Um, and secondly, it allows us to kind of work on problems that might not be from within the same community. You know, for example, we have our collaborators in H3 Africa, which is a big African based genomics initiative, and they have um, created a kind of uh, ancestry tool where you're on the tribe level, and they want to make it as easy as possible to interact with it. So one of their questions is, can we create a kind of really nice API that makes it really user-friendly to use a much more uh, African, specific and African-generated um, ancestry inference tool? And so that's kind of one of the examples of the sorts of projects we're working on. Um, it's still early days, but um, we hope that this might be kind of an interesting way to experiment with different ways of working and then focus more on that tool's behaviours, practices bit, rather than necessarily the data bit. Um, so, I joined John Mason two years ago, um, and I came from uh, doing postdoc maturing, building statistical models that no one's ever going to use in the NHS, um, just sitting on pants at home, feeling kind of depressed in the, in the pandemic. And it's been quite like a, a kind of whirlwind, and you're setting up, you know, recruiting a team, setting up a program, delivering from scratch, in this kind of really ethically, morally, scientifically thought area. Um, and so, just really kind of think about you know, what are some of the key things that I've learned in the last 18 months. Um, and so, I guess one of them is that you probably got this point by now, but data diversity is definitely not just a data problem. You can't think about data diversity with, without thinking about the whole context and the whole environment which, in which data is made. Two, not to make a really obvious point about interdisciplinarity, but genetics, data science, social science, when you put all these disciplines together, you know, things are harder to know. Like, Decisions are slower and, and projects are more complicated to deliver. For sure, diversity in teams is a really easy thing to say. It's quite hard to just make it work. But when we do it, it creates much, much higher quality outputs. And you know, the team that we've got at uh, uh, John Max England is an incredibly unusual, eccentric, eclectic mix of diverse individuals um, that create wonderful outputs. Um, three, that uh, one issue with the fact that we've got these institutional structures like genomics and like any institution like this in the UK is that we both have to have had to implement and deliver the diversity program because we've only got three years to do it because of the way the government's kind of timeline work. And so if you're both trying to sort of deliver things and also sort of change big structures simultaneously, it can be quite challenging to as that as a balancing act. So some people use the analogy of flying the plane, building the plane as you fly, um, which slightly feels like what we're doing a bit at Genomics England. Um, which uh, sometimes is quite exciting, often is quite hectic. Um, but that's one of the kind of the really interesting balances is how do you change the way we think about um, research culture, research practice, research data, um, while some of the and moving forwards. And then the last thing is that you know the moonshot for us is around solving inequalities. That's obviously the moonshot. Um, we, we get out of bed and we think we do that every day. We probably become quite disillusioned. But that is probably why most of us in the team get out of bed every day. And sometimes those problems can seem very big and very overwhelming. You just feel like it's absolutely tiny cog in this big machine of injustices. And so one thing that's kind of very important for us is that when we do have little wins, um, that we celebrate them a lot. Uh, and that, that way it keeps us motivated, um, but also makes us realize that every small step that any individual can take is one step closer. To reduce the um, in our health and in our um, so 
Uh, hopefully, I've been fair in putting everyone's mug box. I think on the way that who's done so much of this work, but um, this is the fact that it has been a very unusual, wonderful, exceptional for young people. And it's been an absolute delight to, to hire them into the team and work through these knotty problems together. Um, and they all contributed in, in different, wonderful ways. Uh, and that is it. So, what do you think of the